So to talk about continental drift, we have to talk about someone named Alfred Wagner. He was a polar researcher, and he was studying the, the, the polar environment at a time when going to the poles, were north and south, were uh, heroic. They were the places where adventurers went. He uh, was born in Germany uh, in 1880, about the turn of the, the last century. Uh, he, he discovered, he didn't really discover, he, he came up with an idea that was interesting. As he was studying the poles, he looked at how glaciers moved, and it was a, it was a struggle uh, to get there. It was a struggle uh, to to see how the world changed, how how the glaciers could, how the glaciers moved and floated, how they crushed each other, what happened when they collided, what happened when they separated. Now this is very telling because one of the things he discovered was continental drift. Again, I hate to use the word discover. He he, he thought of an explanation, a theory that would explain all the observations he had made up to that time. Uh, this, this story is better told by the video that I'm posting on the website, but I'm kind of summarizing it here. The bottom line is that Alfred, uh, uh, while talking to one of his roommates, looked at a map, and he noticed that the southern tip of uh, South Africa, or the, the eastern tip of South Africa, fits into Africa. South America fits in Africa. That that all these pieces of the world fit together like a like a jigsaw puzzle. And being uh, an educated man, he also knew it wasn't just this outline, but he could he knew that the various levels near the coasts, underneath the oceans, also matched. Through his research and and world travels, he knew that. The fossils matched, that the fossils found here in South America matched the fossils found here in Africa. The fossils here in North America matched those found in Europe. He knew, for instance, that the Appalachian Mountains had the same rock strata, the same rock structures that are found in Scotland. He knew that India uh, shared fossils with with. Uh, with Africa, he knew Australia shared fossils with and rock strata with other uh, parts of the continent, even though the Australia is completely separated from any major continent. So he theorized that these all these components of the of the of the continents at some point fit together. Now at the time. He was not a geologist, so the geologists really didn't take him seriously. But the the botanists took him seriously, and they, they said his theory explained so much. It explained why the biodiversity on, on the various continents, uh, the fossil records matched, why he saw that they saw. In it, and I put, I'm going to put on the website uh, an interactive world map that shows you every fossil found up to this point and you can actually click on the fossil evidence and it'll tell you what the fossil is and then you can go on the opposite side of the world and and click on those evidence on that evidence there and you can see that the fossil evidences do match in fact the the components you can take a, a broader view you can zoom out and see where all the fossils are on the planet uh, in a region and look at their composition. You can see their, the composition of the rock strata, the, how old the rock strata is, and you can also then look at how what different animals or plants you found in that rock strata and compare it South America to Africa. It's a very interesting uh, interactive map. Fun, I think. Now, the problem with Alfred Wegener... Uh, Wagner's theory is that he could, didn't have an explanation of what could possibly move continents. Now, 
the Europeans at the time thought that the continents were either sinking or lifting. And they were thinking about that because of, uh, I would, would hope, is because of the, the mountains, how, how they were trying to explain mountains. The North American scientists just felt that this was the way it is and the way it's always been, and the, the, geo, the, the, the structure of the continents, the continents were not changing much at all. But Wagner said they were both wrong, that the continents were changing, they were moving, but they weren't moving up and down the way the Europeans thought, and they weren't static the way the North Americans thought. They were moving horizontally. The problem, that again, that he had is that he could not explain what mechanism could possibly move the entire, all the continents of the world. Not just a mountain, not just a valley, not just a city, but all the land of North America moving somewhere and all the land in South America moving. The forces necessary to, to move such land masses, he just could not explain. And even though he had very strong fossil evidence and you could look at the geologic record and you can see the link, a lot of scientists felt there must be some other explanation. Well, he, was, he died in 1930 of a heart attack while he was uh, in the North Pole uh, on a trek to get more supplies for his base camp. Of course, World War I happened, World War II uh, in, in be well, before he died, and then World War II after he died. Now, during World War II, we had a lot of ships in the, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, in the Atlantic Ocean, most scientists at the time thought that the bottom of the ocean was going to be flat. It was going to be all sandy and flat. Makes sense. Um, like a giant beach, if you will, but underwater. As North American troops and supplies were going to Europe for the war, uh, the, the Germans had a lot of U-boats or submarines that were sinking our ships. So we sent out ships with magnometers or gaussiometers, and they would measure the magnetic fields in the ocean, hoping to find submarines before they could blow up our ships. This is before sonar, right? Before the end of World War II, we had, they developed sonar and they were able to, to find the ships. Well, one of the Navy captains, uh, later after the war, continued to measure the magnetic fields on, uh, with a long cable with the magnometer or Gaussian meter at the end. He'd sink it down and he would travel back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean trying to find the various magnetic fields because what they found was that the magnetic fields uh, changed as they took rock samples too from the bottom of the oceans. The, the interesting thing was that the orientation of the magnetic field along this, there was a center line. The center line ran from uh, from Iceland, which is above Greenland. Uh, I'm not sure which way it goes, but... Something like this, probably above Greenland, Iceland. And on each side of the... Each side they had of this line, they had a layer of rock that whose magnetic field was oriented in one direction. So all the rock they sampled here was, all the magnetic fields were oriented, let's say, towards the north, the way a normal compass would, would be oriented, all right? And along the other side of that, of that, Of that, of that red line 
the magnetic field was also oriented in with all with the compass pointing north that was expected but then on the uh, on the right next to it was a layer of rock whose where the compass the magnetic field would point south so if you put a compass on it the compass would point south instead of north so the magnetic lines were reversed and a little further uh, down, a little further away from that, they were back to pointing north again. On both sides, again, on both sides of the, this red line, this midline. And this kept going all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. He's noticed and documented that these these rocks at the bottom of the ocean, their magnetic orientation reversed polarity over and over again. One side, one layer was pointing north, the next layer was pointing south, and it just kept doing that on all the way up to the continents. They couldn't explain why. But certainly it was an odd description. No one at first no one could figure out what could make rocks point in the, the magnetic field of a rock point in the opposite direction of what of the the opposite direction of all the rest of the rocks on the planet. The rest of the planet on the surface is on the continents, all the you know, the magnetic fields generally pointing north. It was strange. Unless you were over um, like a, me uh, um, um, a metal, um, uh, you know, iron deposit. It might make your magnet swoop around. But on each side of this layer, these uh, Atlantic Ocean, uh, across this mid-Atlantic line, the middle of the Atlantic line, there were these rocks, the polarity, the magnetic fields kept flipping on both sides. So it was just really strange. And after thinking about it, the only thing they could think that could possibly allow that to happen is if there was a magnet. Now remember, the Earth's magnetic field is such. And it's not quite as neat as I'm drawing it. It's actually neater than some planets. Some planets like Jupiter, their magnetic fields are wild. Uh, but ours does fluctuate. And this is a horrible drawing. But it goes, the magnetic field lines go something like this. So any rock that's made during like that comes out of the earth, the magma that comes out of the earth is lava and then and then solidifies. While it's still in liquid form, while that lava or magma is still in, in a in a liquid form, all the iron particles, all the little iron particles that are part of the uh, the rock, the liquid rock, are still liquids, they can move around or fluid, so they can all line up, and they line up in orientation with the magnetic field lines of the Earth. So if this rock, so if this rock were made on the Earth while north was north and south was south, so the magnetic field lines flowed in this direction. Then this rocks, this rock would have a north, if you dug that rock up or put it over that, that magnetic field device, put it over the rock, you get a north and a south that, that matches the magnetic field lines of the earth. That made sense to everybody. 
Now, what could make this these magnetic field lines be exactly the opposite? What could make the magnetic field lines flip? Well, it had to happen while the it had to happen while the rock was being made. It had to be the north for north to go south and south to go north, the magnetic field of the earth must have flipped and the rock must have been fluid when it was flipped. So the rock must have been made when the magnetic field lines of the earth were in reverse. And indeed, we know today that the earth's magnetic field is flipping. The north is going south and south is going north. And we know at some point in the near future, the North Pole, the North Pole will become the South Pole and the South Pole, the North Pole. Now, that doesn't mean that the, the land is going to flip, but the magnetic fields, right, the force field that is driven by iron in the Earth swirling, these magnetic fields are going to switch. Why do they switch? I'm not sure anybody knows. Um, uh, we know they happen periodically. We know that they happen almost in, in in a fairly regular fashion. And we know that any rocks made during the during a partic that particular period, for instance, if any rock is made today, it's going to be oriented so that the north is pointing north and the south is pointing south because all the iron particles in the rock are going to align themselves according to this magnetic field that exists today, which is north is north and south is south. But any rock made after the magnetic field flips, where south is north and north is south, then those rocks are going to, their magnetic field is their magnetic field is going to be flipped. So what we what we have here is evidence then when put together with what Alfred Wagner had discovered in the 30s 30 years before this naval captain went back and forth across the ocean was the geomagnetic field lines were switching that on each side of the uh, this line there were these mag uh, these these consistent north south flips from the center line the fossils were the same in Africa as they were in South America and Antarctica, the, 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 the rock layers matched, North America matched with Europe, the Australia, India, and Africa matched in a lot of their fossils, a lot of their orientations, India and Australia, for instance, matched very much in their, in their, uh, in their orientation. I mean, they looked at the magnetic, the magnetic uh, layers of the deeper rocks, they saw that that in South America, north was north, south was south. In, in Antarctica, though, in the same layer, the same area of rock, this is continental. Now, this is not oceanic. This is oceanic crust. So something was weird was happening here. We were switching. Here, though, in South America, north was north, south was south. In Africa, north was just slightly to the left. These rocks had an orientation. It was slightly to the left. In India, the, nor the rock magnetic field of the rock actually pointed in this direction a good what 30 degrees 33 degrees to the uh, to the west versus straight up and down north Australia also 30 degrees to the west here in, in Antarctica is about what 20 degrees to the right so why would the magnetic field, the geomagnetic poles of these particular rocks 150 million years ago, why would they look at how they're oriented? Even though the rock layers are all the same, they're oriented in, in an odd way. So these, ideally, theoretically, all these were made at the same time. We have carb uh, radioactive data that would tell us that they were all made at the same time. So it wasn't that they were molten, 
it wasn't that they were they were liquid when in the magnetic field line switched and even if they had switched north to south they would not have switched in these odd angles well if you can imagine imagine if let's just take a look at antarctica right let's take a close up look at antarctica imagine if if wagner was correct the land, Antarctica, was pointing north when it was where when that rock was made, that land was pointing north in this direction. South America was pointing pretty much in the direction it is now. Africa used to be pointing in this direction, but now it's pointing in this direction. So it was like this. Antarctica was like this separately moving around horizontally on an axis. India, at some point, was like this, right? Because that would be north. But somehow, over time, it actually twisted this way. And Australia was like this, but somehow, over time, it moved in that orientation. So that was suggesting that those magnetic those magnetic lines suggest how they moved horizontally that they actually turned in a uh, Australia would have turned in a counterclockwise in Australia uh, India also in counterclockwise fashion Africa slightly counterclockwise Antarctica actually turned clockwise while South America turned only slight, slightly so then not only would they the does this do these lines suggest separation, right? Because this suggested that these are were all liquid at the same time, and then these were liquid at a different time, and these were liquid at a different time. But it also suggested that these here were turning in circles. The fossils on that are being this are the same on each side suggest that these these land masses were connected. Now, if it was just one group of fossils or a couple group of, of fossils, or if the, if the fossils here were the same as the fossils over here, one might think that, you know, maybe they, they crossed the ocean, like we discussed when we talked about island coloni colonization. But it's not just that they matched. They matched perfectly with the geology and the geography of the land masses, Everything seemed to be pointing that Alfred Wegener's theories were correct. The magnetic field lines flipping, the, the land pieces fitting, the, the rock strata, the types of rocks matching, the magnetic fields on the continents al uh, themselves aligning in such a way that when you turn them, when you cut them out and turn them, all the, mag all the, all the compasses would point to this in the same direction. And it just, and when you also, when you look at how the glaciers moved 350 to 230 million years ago, and how they, the direction of movement of those glaciers, when you put the, these land pieces back together again, those glacier movements make sense. As they, they follow the same path as if all these land masses were together and the glaciers moved across the land while it was still together. All right. There's a lot of good evidence there, but still they, they were missing that one piece, the, the mechanism by which this land could be moved. And today we know, and we've discussed it, these ideas of convection currents in, in, in the Earth's surface. And we know this because of seismographs, the ability to, when earthquakes happen, we're able to tell how quickly the, the Earth, the sound, the, the shaking, the vibrations of the Earth move through the Earth because of the different speeds that they move through liquid versus solid, we're able to tell that the Earth's inner, uh, the Earth's inside, underneath the Earth's surface, the layers of the Earth are not all solid, that there are liquid layers and semi-liquid layers and, you know, right, let's not say liquid, let's say fluid layers and semi-fluid layers and solid layers. And these layerings, suggests that because of heat rises and colder material sinks, 
due to density differences, we get those convection currents that we discussed earlier. And those convection currents allow these plates to move. Later on with radar, we were able to say, see that this the bottom of the ocean is not flat, that there are mountains and ridges. In fact, this center line is composed of a mid-Atlantic ridge where the earth is open, split open with volcanoes spewing forth new land all the time as along this boundary, it's called a divergent boundary, along this boundary what we have is movement in opposite directions. Divergent, meaning moving away from. All right, moving away from this center line. So there's a convection current underneath this land that's moving in this direction, like so as the magma rises and sinks, this current turns in this direction, this in this direction, pushing the land here that's newly made out towards the continents and this land out towards these continents. Then when it gets here to North America, South America, Africa, Europe, you have what's called a subduction zone because the continental shelves are less dense, they float on top, the oceanic uh, plates are more dense, they sink. So this is all new land compared to, to the continental, uh, the continental land, the land on the continents, on la the land itself versus the continent, uh, the, uh, the plates that are underneath the oceans, the, the lands, uh, the, the, the material, the, the, the soil, the rock on land is much older than the rock that's at the bottom of the ocean since that land that's at the bottom of the ocean actually sinks. Those plates sink and get melted again in the rock cycle. And that explains how this, these lines can keep reforming and keep flipping and why the, north, the continental plates have stayed fairly consistent over time because they haven't been melted. So here you have these land masses, these, these directions of the ice sheets are listed here, geomagnetic pole directions listed here, distribution of, a, of fossils. You'll see there's a fossil here and fossil, these fossils are the same here and here. They're all the same. Notice the rock layer here, here, and here is the same. Notice the rock layer here is the same as the rock layer here. Also, if you if you think about it, if you have to twist this to the left, you have to twist this to the right to get both these compasses to point north, this layer then matches this layer. Isn't that interesting? If you just take it and twist it, this layer would meet this layer. Now, this is a completely set, different set of data, different set of evidence. But if you made the, the compass directions match, you would see that the layers of rock also matched. And also, by the way, if you did that, if you twisted this left and this right, not only would the rock layers match, the magnetic field lines would match, but so would the direction of the ice sheet movement. Notice this would then point north, and this would point a little more north too, so they would actually move in the same direction. Interesting. When you twist, you see this layer matches here. You see this layer matches there. If you turn this in this direction, you start to see that those rock layers, this, if you put this here, this part of this rock layer, this old Precambrian would match this rock layer, and this part of this rock layer would match this rock layer. So the rock layers start to match across uh, across the world if you if you line them all up and you connect them you'll notice that these are late Paleozoic and you'll note that this late Paleozoic these all match all this land all these rocks match well if we take a look at the, the what the fossils would look like if we put them together 
they would look something like this. So looking, when we put the land masses together, all of a sudden the fossil evidence makes perfect sense. If these land masses were all connected, then these animals could have easily walked across and this could have been part of their territory or they could have been cousin groups or different populations of them all across this land because they could just walk over versus being separated by an entire ocean, right? So it seems, with all this evidence, it seems likely that we have something called continental drift and that continental drift separated these populations and over time, these two populations, uh, obviously some of them went extinct, but some changed you get a different set of animals living in South America today than you get in Africa because the conditions have changed and the populations have been isolated for so long. Now you have some dire some directions here to go ahead and use this data, all this information, the next couple pages, follow these directions, right? Come up with a deduction, cut them out, paste them together, follow the direction of the ancient ice sheets, do your best to orient them in such a way to make everything match up. Next few pages, I think you'll see that one of the pages has a blank so that you can cut out these continents and then you can go ahead and draw some of the arrows or the north, the, the compasses, the way they're oriented here and then you can go ahead and cut them out and try to paste them together in such a way as to make them match the way you would see here in this example. Well, I hope this helped with your project and I hope you see that all this evidence, all discovered by a meteorologist, a, a man studying the weather in the Arctic, who in his balloon looked down and saw how the ice shifted and banged into each other and separated, and then later looking at the, at the, at the map of the world, thought that these things could be floating on some kind of magma ocean, just like the ice was floating on the ocean in the Arctic. And this man's dreams, this man's passion for trying to discover how things work, he died doing it, and his wife actually said, leave him his body there, since that's where he's, his life has been spent in order to honor him. This guy is responsible for us understanding why and how these tectonic plates moved also helps explain how populations could have been isolated and help explain how, why we have so many different species in South America than we do in Africa, than you do in Asia, than you do in North America, etc. The interrelatedness of the organisms of life and evolution can is partly explained by continental drift and the separation of the populations over time. So go ahead and take a look at this, cut it all up, put it together, and uh, hopefully you all understand what continental drift is. All right, have a good one.